Hi, everyone. I'm AJ Woodhams, host of the War Books podcast, where I interview today's best authors writing about war-related topics. Today, I'm here with Woody Holton uh, with his new book, Liberty is Sweet, The Hidden History of the American Revolution. Woody Holton is the Peter and Bonnie McCausland Professor of History at the University of South Carolina in Columbia. His 2009 book, Abigail Adams, which he wrote on a Guggenheim Fellowship, won the Bancroft Prize. And Woody, I love this line in your bio, his books of required reading on more than 200 college campuses, yeah. which is good news because I found your book so insightful. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's good to hear. But anyway, how are you doing today, Woody? I'm good. I'm good. I'm really grateful for this chance to talk about a little bit about the military history of the Revolutionary War. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on. I learned so much about the American Revolution from your book. And obviously, it's about the history of the overlooked people of the American Revolution, uh, Native Americans, African Americans, women, religious dissenters, but also small things that I I didn't think I'd be coming across. For example, Paul Revere, he would have never said the British are coming because people still considered themselves British at the time. And I was like, huh, I guess that makes sense. But my whole life, you know, that's, that's a story, a myth that we've got, that we've built up. And your book talks a lot about these myth makers who've, who've really told a lot of stories uh, about the American Revolution. So I, I really, I, I, I just, I found your book so insightful. Um, well, since for, you mentioned for, that, AJ, I got to confess to a myth, to doing some myth making of my own by mistake. For, I've been teaching for 30 years, and I think I spent about the first 20 of those saying, oh yeah, that myth about Revere saying the British are coming, that comes from the famous Paul Revere the poem by Longfellow, you know, that all, the one that also has one if I land, two if I see. And I finally read the whole poem, and it's not from there. <laughs> so <laughs> even the myth busters are often myth makers, <laughs> sometimes inadvertently. No, no, that's fine. Well, I mean, your your book has just like a ton of myths that you dispel. So I think we'll give you a pass on that one because you, you. Have, you, have, you pointed out all these others. But yeah, like a, a really fascinating read. Really enjoyed it. Kind of before we, we dive into your, your book, First, I'm always kind of I'm interested in in historians and and what makes them tick. What got you interested in this this time period in the first place? This isn't your first book about uh, the revolutionary period. What what got you interested in it? Well, if you mean in the very first place, I'll tell you what a lot of people have been saying about uh, the musical Hamilton, which you know is soon to be a motion major motion picture. But many years before that, motion picture was 1776. And my brother is a little bit younger than me, and I basically memorized it. It's so fun. You know, there's very sad scenes in it and gripping scenes that really remind us that slavery was a northern as well as a southern uh, phenomenon. That, you know, the northern colonies like Pennsylvania and Massachusetts depended on slavery uh, economically as much as Virginia and South Carolina did because that was their market. But anyway, uh, we saw uh, 1776, and uh, both of us got very excited about it. And so that was sort of planted as an interest of mine. And then I got to grad school at Duke in 1982, and everybody there was not talking about the founding fathers so much as saying, you know, we've got enough on them. Let's study the other 99% enslaved people and women, Native Americans and so forth. So my interest has always been trying to connect my 12-year-old interest with my 25-year-old interest, and since I was 25, in ordinary people. So that, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Is I've, My father was a big fan of Thomas Jefferson. I think he became more ambivalent about Jefferson as he learned more about the other side of Jefferson, but we still all admire his principles, if not always what he did. And so I picked that up from dad and from the that, that amazing play slash movie 1776 and 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 but the overlay for me has been trying to not throw that off throw that out when getting into social history but trying to connect the two kinds of history that's really great and really interesting that you say that so i'm a myself i'm a i'm a fiction writer and of course i've always loved books and i've always loved fiction and i think a lot about like my like my 14 year old self <laughs> 
just like how <laughs> like right. how how cool I thought it would be to be a novelist and to to write books and to to live in that world and it it is like a really it's a it's it's a thing I think about a lot like it's a I don't know if it's a driving force but it it, it is like you know it's definitely an origin story going back even even to when I was a teenager so it's interesting to hear you say that well what inspired you then to to write this book uh the hidden history of the american revolution you've like i said you've you've written a couple of other books on this topic previously what inspired you to write this one an insane delusion and that delusion was that having written um I'd done a book because it was kind of about class. My first book called Force Founders. One was kind of about gender, uh, the Abigail Adams book, and one that was mostly about race. Uh, well, actually, the Force Founders book was race and class, but uh, did one about gender and then I, I did a Constitution book that was really about a, sort of a class interpretation of the origins of the Constitution. So I figured with all of that and with teaching uh, the American Revolution for 20 years, I thought, oh, this will be a piece of cake. You know, I can wrap this up in a couple of years. What I didn't anticipate was how ignorant I was of the military history of the Revolutionary War. And I was lucky enough to get a contract with a great publisher, Simon & Schuster. But, you know, they have, as a commercial press, unlike, say, the University of Virginia Press, where a lot of friends of mine have published, or University of Har Harvard's Press, a great press, they wanted they they knew their their readers wanted to hear about the battles and I said well I don't know that much about the battles and my editor said well learn and that took me ten years really to just catch up on what other people had said about the battles but then beyond that to say something new about them and but I'm really glad I was deluded because probably if I'd you know you've probably had this with books you've worked on if you'd known how long it would have it was going to take you never would have started you know that's true of Columbus by the way so we have good company. If he'd known there was this big pair of continents between him and China, which was his destination, he never would have set out on that trip. Uh, and so I think delusions can, you know, delusions can be dangerous, but delusions can also be quite helpful because I've just, I ended up, my favorite part, I don't know if you could tell this reading it, AJ, but um, of course I'm interested in the origins of the revolution and the long term, uh, long term results. And I do have my little economic take on the constitution that I'm proud of, but the part where I, my juices were really pumping was the part that I hadn't really wanted to write initially. And that is of the military history, because I discovered a, it's just sort of inherently fascinating and B it is so full of myths, as you said. So there's lots of myths to combat and C I had participated with a lot of other people who have PhDs in this very snotty uh, delusion that military history is just stories you know, oh, if you really want to analyze, then you should do intellectual history or, um, and there are all these cool new mo uh, movements that I've taken place of, taken part in, or one of my grad students wrote a great dissertation that classifies as the history of emotions. And so that stuff is brainy, but you can write a brainy history of the, uh, of the, of the battles as well, you know, where you're making arguments of, uh, about the battles. And I know I didn't always succeed at that, but that was a fun goal to pursue. And I really, as I say, I enjoyed it's about half half the battles, and I enjoyed that half a lot, a lot more than the other half, actually. Well, let's dive right into the book then. At first, kind of talking about military history. You know, right off the bat, I want to ask you. This is something that I thought was very surprising. I'm not a historian of the American Revolution, but I'm sure I've never heard this. That uh, something you say is the British never had a chance yeah. of winning the Revolutionary War. Why is that? Well, first, let me say that's one of those things that I think there's lots of evidence for, but uh, I wouldn't bet my house on it. Uh, and certainly if other people have disagreed with me about that. Uh, so I'd love it if some of your viewers looked at my version of it and then looked at some of the, uh, some of the critiques of it and made up their mind. But here's where that comes from. It comes from the British generals themselves. So William Howe, was the leader, really the hero of the Battle of Bunker Hill. As everybody knows, the British won that battle. They drove the Americans off that hill near Boston. Um, but five days after he won this great victory, and you can imagine people carrying him on their shoulders. Yeah, he's our hero. He led us to victory. Five days after that victory, that's when William Howe said, 
we cannot win this war. Because he saw what happened when he drove the Americans off of Bunker Hill. They went down that hill. A few of them were killed, of course. But then they went to the next hill and climbed up on top of that hill where their buddies had already started building fortifications. And so after conquering Bunker Hill, he was just going to have to go take the next hill. And I've left out the most important part of this, which is in conquering Bunker Hill with 2,000 soldiers, he lost half of them. That's not 1,000 dead people, but 1,000 uh, casualties. Uh, and, you know, and in battle, a wounded person is worse than a dead person because you've got to carry them off. And so he saw that the Americans were just going to win a war of attrition by just retreating to the next hill. And actually, there was something in the, in the imagination of these British officers that exaggerated the difference between Europe and America. If you've been to Europe, you know there's lots of hilly places over there too. But people like Howe had fought most of their, had done most of their previous fighting in what we call the Low Countries still today, um, what's now Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. And it is quite flat over there. And so you can't go entrench on a hill. And that's how these soldiers got in the habit of fighting out on a, on a plane. And the Americans, you know, it's a myth that some people have that the Americans fought a guerrilla war. If you watch the movie The Patriot, you'd get that idea that there almost was no Continental Army, that there's only these militiamen hiding behind trees and stone walls. And that is how the Americans fought it, uh, fought the British on their way home to Boston from, from Concord in, you know, on April 19th, 1775, the Battle of Lexington and Concord. But, but that's, the Americans were not going to fight a guerrilla war the whole time, partly candidly from as a matter of ego because that seemed it seemed unfair it seemed like what we would call terrorism today so the americans were were were, were going to fight the the british in a somewhat conventional way but there was nothing shameful for them about entrenching on a hill and saying to quote one of their famous phrases come and take it and and how and burgoyne who would lose the most important battle of the revolutionary war a couple of years later they both understood in 1775 that the Americans, we can beat them in any particular battle, but they're just going to retreat to the next hill and inflict 50% casualties on us as we take that hill and then the next and then the next uh, and then the next. And, and I'll tell you that I was partly influenced by living when I live when we tried so hard to conquer the Taliban in Afghanistan. And, you know, I think most or some large percentage of the Afghan people were with us even on that one. But you're talking about being just, an American. Yes. About we, when yeah. I mean me, I mean, we Americans in the, in the present, you know, we failed in Afghanistan. The British, I think had failed twice there. The Russians had failed there. And of course we failed in Vietnam and the Russians, thank God are failing in Ukraine today. There are ways of defeating insurgency that the British could theoretically have used and won the war here, but they they were only theoretically possible because what it would have meant is what some Brits were talking about doing, and that is just carrying sword, fire and sword throughout the continent. That is attacking civilians as well as armies. And the British had defeated Native American revolts and slave revolts, revolts in Ireland. They had defeated those revolts but only because they had no compunction about slaughtering Irish and Native and uh, and African and Black people. They had no compunction about just slaughtering them. I mean, I think one of the most telling moments of the Revolutionary War happens, uh, what is it, six months after, f- five months after Bunker Hill. There's a town that's now Portland, Maine, but with then Falmouth, Massachusetts, and the British bombed the hell out of Falmouth. I mean, there was something like 300 buildings and none of them was left standing after this bombardment from the uh, British fleet. But guess how many people in Falmouth were killed in that bombardment? And the answer is zero, zero injured, because the British said, we're going to bomb your city. You've got five minutes to get the hell out of town. And everyone got out of town. And and why did they do that? Because they uh, had they massacred their own white colonists, the way they'd massacred Indians and people in the other India, in, in real real Indians as well in India, uh, and and blacks and so forth, they they would have turned the British people against them. So there was a phrase that some conservatives used describing why we lost in Vietnam, and that is that we fought the war with 
one hand tied behind our backs. And that's true. You know, the U.S. could have used nuclear weapons in Vietnam. Thank God we didn't. Uh, for all the millions of innocent lives that would have cost and just think what it would have done to our reputation in the world. But but you see what I mean? That there was a limit placed on the British when yeah. fighting their own white colonists that wasn't placed on them when they were fighting damn, this is not me speaking, of course, but them damn Catholics in, in Ireland uh, or people of color. Yeah. And that, this is what I thought was so insightful about your book was, and, you know, of course, today we, we attitudes, thankfully, are very different, but um, throughout, throughout your book, you really, you get a sense of the things that the colonists and the Europeans were willing to do to the the native populations, to to African Americans, that just really, that you write at one point, and this is actually a question I had later on, but since we're talking about it, you write at one point that the colonists were, and this is pre-revolution, the colonists were meeting with some Native American leaders, and one of the the traditions is to give them a gift when they leave. And the gift that the colonists gave these Native American leaders were blankets. Now, these blankets just so happened to have come from a smallpox ward. And yes. they were they were using germ warfare against the, the Native Americans um, because they, they knew how vulnerable they were to, to disease, um, which I thought I was just I was shocked. Yeah. You know, and there's a lot of aspects of 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 white's treatment of Native Americans that because we only have one side's documents we're speculative about. But here we literally had the receipts. That is the the people who sold the blankets to replace those in the hospital, you know, said, OK, we're, we're selling these blankets to the British Army Fort. This was at Pittsburgh. It was then called Fort Pitt. Um, we're selling you these blankets to replace the ones from the smallpox hospital that you gave to kill the Indians. So we literally had the receipt. And the amazing thing about that is the, the commander at Fort Pitt, whose name was Bouquet, he was a uh, Swiss, I think, uh, who gave that order, oh, but working for Britain, who gave that order, he, he didn't know it, but his commander in chief, Thomas, uh, I'm sorry, um, Jeffrey Amherst over in New York, was at that exact moment writing him a letter suggesting the same thing. So evil minds think alike. Yeah. And I was in, there's instance after instance. Um, maybe let's, let's talk about, uh, I guess the overlooked groups. Um, maybe we'll just talk a little bit more about uh, native Americans. Um, um, maybe just, can you tell, give us some context right now for native Americans before the revolution and the decades leading up to it, what was going on between the, uh, this is a very big question, but what was going on between the Native Americans and the colonists? Well, uh, one of the things I'll plug about my book is that with the help of an amazing uh, graduate student here named Riley Sutherland, I compiled the first ever population table from many sources so, so that we know how many black and white people lived in each of the 13 colonies, but also all the British colonies in the Caribbean. Uh, so, you know, there were 26 British colonies in America uh, in 1776, only 13 of which rebelled. But also we got the best uh, estimates we could of native populations as well. And if you add that all up, there's something, still something like 100,000 Native Americans living east of the Mississippi River. So they've been much reduced by smallpox and other diseases and by being hunted with dogs and, and enslaved and sold, sold off into slavery and dying on plantations while working alongside African slaves and so forth. So they've, their populations have been decimated, but have actually recovered a little bit. So there, was, there are 100,000 of them, but they are not, of course, one tribe. They're a bunch of different Indian nations often at war with each other. Uh, and that was the great advantage. You know, you hear about the British strategy of divide and conquer they didn't have to be smart for that to work because these nations were already uh, divided. And so you'd get some allying with the French and some allying with the British uh, and so forth. But this was one of the really fun discoveries that I made while researching the book. Remember, my big theme is to connect the traditional political and military history, Washington, Jefferson, Hancock, Adams, with the the more hidden history of Native Americans and women and, and so forth. And this was one of those points of connection because uh, 
you know, if you walk out your front door and just ask people on the street, uh, what's one phrase you remember from the American Revolution? Just about everybody's going to call up from their third grade class, no taxation without representation. You know, that there were lots of other issues that I write about the, in the book, but tax is the one we all understand. The first big tax was the Stamp Act. And I make the case in Liberty is Sweet, and I think I've got good evidence for it, that had there been no Native Americans, there would have been no Stamp Act. And to explain that, um, the British were determined in 1763 to avoid another expensive war against Native Americans. War then as now was the most expensive thing government did. And um, the previous war, which ended in that year, 1763, had doubled uh, the British uh, debt. So they didn't want to go to war against Indians again. So they say, oh, well, what do we need to do to placate them? They drew a line along the crest of the Appalachian Mountains saying, we're not going to steal any more of your land west of that line. We're going to turn it into a giant Indian reservation. And again, the British aren't doing this out of humane kindness. They're doing it because they don't want to pay for another war. So we're going to draw this line, but then to enforce that line, they made an extraordinary decision that they'd never done before. After all these other wars in America, the British had fought four or five of them, they had pulled their troops home, you know, bring the troops home. But this time they left 10,000 troops in America mostly to guard that line to keep the Indians from attacking the colonists, you know, from blowing up into a bigger war, and also to keep the colonists from attacking the Indians, which, again, it sounds really humane, but the British wanted the colonists to leave the Indians alone so the Indians wouldn't attack and then start a war the Big Brother, that is, the British government, would have to come and, and put down. And it's expensive to have those troops out there on the western frontier, uh, I think of them as a wall of troops, just mostly so I can make the following joke, which is the British government figured, OK, we're going to build this wall of troops out there on the frontier to protect the Indians from the colonists, colonists from the Indians. But if we're going to build this wall on the western border, we think it's reasonable to make the colonists pay for it. And that's the Stamp Act. And so if you actually read the Stamp Act, it says not that what most teachers tell, and me, including me for 20 years, telling students, oh, the Stamp Act is there to uh, help pay off the British government's debt from that previous war that ended in 1763. But that's not what the Stamp Act says. The Stamp Act says this money is to pay for those 10,000 troops. So I, I would go so far as to say no Indians, no Stamp Act. And the Stamp Act was the first, it was sort of the, the, the entering wedge of this whole series of taxes, like the famous one on tea uh, that the British would adopt later. And so even if you don't care about Native Americans one bit, you can't understand the origins of the American Revolution without knowing what Native Americans were up to and how the British government was responding to them. Yeah. And that's so interesting because so, so then your, your argument is that the, the British argument at the time was, hey, colonists, we're defending you against the Native Americans right now. We're we're holding this line. Um, um, without us, um, you know, you would be overrun by by all these these uh, these Native warriors. And so, because of that, you should pay your fair share. Also, a little naive because the the colonists didn't want to be protected from the Indians. They were happy to go to war with the Indians because every time they did go to war against the Indians. Uh, they got more of their land. Uh, and so the British were kind of deluding themselves in saying, oh, the colonists are going to be so grateful for us holding the line. And remember, as the annual register, which was kind of an official newspaper of the British government, said those Indians were there to, I mean, the, those troops were there on the western border of the colonies to, quote, awe and protect the Indians. And I really like that formulation to, to all the Indians, you know, keep them subjected, but also to protect the Indians from the colonists for all the reasons that you understand well, if the Indian, if the colonists attack the Indians, the Indians are going to hit back. And then it's just like, a, you know, your little brother picks a fight and the big brother has to come rescue him. Uh, that's what the British were trying to avoid. Well, talk a little bit about how the, the relationship uh, evolved between. So during, so leading right up to the American revolution and then during the revolution, how did the relationship between the Native Americans and the colonists evolve? And then also between the Native Americans and the British? 
Right. Well, one of the fascinating things that happened in the in the late 1760s is all these battles over smuggling and and taxes and on on the money supply were happening on the east coast something was happening out west and that really began with a group of of women living on the Wabash River on the border of what's now Indiana and Illinois they looked at that diverse situation I described to you a minute ago of all these Indian nations who were often at war with each other and said, you know what, this isn't working. You know, if the British attack the Cherokees and the Choctaws don't help, or if the Choctaws say, oh, this is our chance to hit the Cherokees from the other direction because we hate them too. United we stand, divided we fall. Basically, these Native women were saying, they said it not through written communications, which they didn't have, but through wampum belts, you know, those beaded belts. These Native women, who they were called the female peace chiefs, at least by whites, they sent wampum belts all around to other Native societies saying, let's, to use the modern phrase, bury the hatchet among ourselves and form a coalition of former enemies to combat the encroachment on our land. Because even though the British drew this line along the crest of the Appalachians and put troops there to keep it, the American, the white Americans were just so determined to get past it that they did get past it. So anyway, these native women say we native people need to unite as one people. They started to think of themselves as the red race. Uh, you know, we think of the, the myth of Indians as red came from whites, but Jeannie, uh, a, a, a professor friend of mine has really made a strong case that it was, um, uh, it was, uh, it was natives who helped think, start thinking of themselves as the red race. And, and they did that on purpose. You know, let's let's focus on what we have in common with each other as the red Indian native people as against the whites trying to coach. My point about this is uh, while those native women were organizing, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and others were petitioning the British government to get rid of that line along the crest of the Appalachians and let them have all that Western land. And incredibly, the British government ignored all these wealthy white American colonists and listened to the Indians instead and stuck by that line. And so that shows up in the Declaration of Independence. You know, all those grievances they mention against the king. They mention taxes, which I agree is important, once. They mention Native Americans and their land three times in the Declaration of Independence. So that is definitely one of the grievances that, not certainly not the only one, but one of the big grievances that provoked the colonists to to rebel. But then let me say briefly what happens once the war gets started, even while the Americans were winning the war in the East, most famously at Yorktown, in the West, it's really the Native Americans who won the war. They launched constant raids into Western New York and Pennsylvania, Western Virginia, which is now Kentucky, into the Carolinas, where I live. Uh, They really had the Americans like Daniel Boone, who they captured twice and, and killed one of his sons, captured his daughter. They really had the Americans back on their heels. And the big reason for that was that these Native Americans who had been resisting the British and the British colonists all these years now have the British on their side because the British in their desperation, we've talked about all the challenges that the British faced in trying to conquer the colonists, In their desperation, the British made alliances with Native Americans, and we could talk later if you want about another even more controversial alliance that the British made with African Americans. But this alliance that they made with Native Americans was quite effective in stopping uh, the further westward expansion of the colonists during the Revolutionary War because the British, A, supplied the Native Americans with guns and ammunition, which obviously are crucial and which they didn't make any more than most colonists knew how to make, uh, you know, lead bullets and and, uh, gunpowder and and weapons to fire them from. So A, the the British supplied them with with guns and ammo, but then B, the British supplied them with something even more important than that, and that is unity. That is a very interesting political dynamic took place where you had all these native societies that had been trying to unite, but they were very suspicious of each other because the the Cherokees did make peace with the Iroquois in the 1760s, but they didn't want to become subservient to the Iroquois. So if there's a coalition being created, 
and the Iroquois at the head of it. Well, no, I'm not sure. We 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 think we should be at the head of it, and well, we think we should be at the head of it. But one thing they could agree on was letting the British head it because the British, not because the British were so powerful, but just sort of the opposite reason, because the British were symbolic uh, and 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 didn't have a lot of troops on the ground in the West, and so they weren't as much of a threat, and so. You know, I think I should lead the coalition. You know, we're the chair because we should lead it. And you're the Air Corps. You think you should lead it. Well, the one thing we should agree on is to let the British lead it, because at least I'm not being led by you. At least you're not being led by me. So that happened. And they, they really did achieve a pretty good unity during the war. And the white Americans fighting the Native Americans in the West at the same time they were fighting the British in the East, they understood uh, that they were losing in the West. They also understood that merely by having all these Native American attacks, it was preventing Western white men from joining the Continental Army. And so, you know, there was a labor crisis as early as 1776 uh, on the American side. And then throughout the war, they just could not get enough soldiers. They would constantly send out quotas. OK, we need this many from Pennsylvania, this many from New Jersey, and nobody hardly ever met their quotas. So anyway, so it's depriving the Americans of, of, of soldiers to fight in the East, and it's depriving the Americans of the Western land they want, and they completely blame the British. And so they set one goal in the West, which they knew would encompass all the others, and that was to capture Fort Detroit, now the city of Detroit at the Straits uh, up there in the Great Lakes. And, um, and so the Americans, like George Washington, George Rogers Clark, Thomas Jefferson, when he was governor of Virginia, and others that you've heard of, they came up with, over the course of the war, about a dozen plans to capture Fort Detroit. But then here's the big news about that. Not one of those plans was successful. They never got uh, to Detroit because those same Native Americans, whom the colonists were so worried about, didn't let the, the colonists get anywhere near Detroit. And so there's a real sense in which the natives won with their allies, the British, won the war in the West. But then the tragic part of this is the way the British completely sold out their native allies at the bargaining table, because, of course, Native Americans were not represented in Paris in 1783 when they finally signed a treaty. The Brits and Americans signed a treaty and the Brits just signed away everything east of the Mississippi, almost none of which except these few forts they controlled, but they can said, you can have that land. It wasn't theirs to give, of course, it was yeah. Native American. Mm -hmm. And I will say for the Native Americans, they didn't take this lying down. Oh, okay, the British have given away our land. We'll move west of the Mississippi. They continued to fight for that land for well into the 19th century. Yeah, you, you really get the sense that the Native Americans, their relationship with the, with the British was that they were useful for a brief period of time, and that's it, um, which is is really awful. You so you mentioned that I could I could keep going about some of the stuff you wrote about Native Americans, but I want to talk about the African Americans in the Revolution because uh, I know we're we're we've we got about thirteen minutes left. So let's start with the African Americans. Similarly, right before the revolution and then during the revolution. Okay, just to start with the demographics, one in five Americans was enslaved by one of, by some other uh, Americans. And in South Carolina, where I'm talking to you from today, uh, a slight majority of the people of the human beings in South Carolina were black slaves. They were always going to be part of the equation. They were 90 percent of the people in the British colonies in the Caribbean, and that had the understandable effect preventing those Caribbean colonies from joining in the rebellion. They were also subjected to the Stamp Act because they got some of those troops uh, and to other British measures. And so they did protest some of these measures. But as things started to really heat up, they dropped out of the Patriot Coalition and ended up remaining loyal, as you know, well into the 20th century. Some of those were still, and they're still part of the British Commonwealth today, many of those places like Jamaica. So in that case, where you have 90% enslaved, that's a real discourager of, of whites to rebel because they knew, and of course, this would happen later in Haiti, if whites rebel against whites, then that gives blacks a chance to rebel against whites as well. But in places like Virginia, they had all these other grievances, and they, and by the 
1774, 1775, they were furious at the British, but they really weren't ready to go to war. And so there's a big question about what was it that pushed the colonists over the edge? And But then the, and independence didn't come until July of 1776. So the big question is, what drove the colonists to declare from being just angry at the British Empire to wanting to get all the way out of it? And I'd say the single biggest factor, if you look at all 13 colonies, was the Battle of Lexington and Concord, which you know we rightly describe as the first battle of the Revolutionary War, but it was also the final argument for independence. About 70 colonists were killed that day. And, you know, that's they'd already called it a massacre when five people had been killed by the Brits uh, five years earlier uh, without authorization. You know, but here we have commanders telling their guys to fire uh, and killing 70 Americans. And so that really pushed a lot of New Englanders, especially over the edge into saying the hell with it. We're ready to declare independence. But in the South, the sort of the southern equivalent of Lexington and Concord was an Emancipation Proclamation issued in November of 1775 by the See, governor that, that's of That's one of the things. I had no idea that there was an Emancipation Proclamation way before Abraham Lincoln. I was so surprised to read that. And you are not alone, AJ. It's amazing how many well-read people that uh, I speak to it. It's kind of fun for me because I'll give a speak to a DAR group or a history roundtable and they'll they'll be astonished at this and they'll think I'm the one who discovered it. Well, a black historian named uh, Benjamin Quarles wrote a wonderful book called The Negro in the American Revolution. You can see how old it is by its title, 1961. Everything I'm going to tell you, he he had worked out in 1961 and there are people and been people noticing it even earlier than that. So, so, but it, but it has not gotten out beyond historians for some reason. And I will say, they talked about this in the 1619 project, the New York Times project, and and that got it out to a wider audience, and it became so controversial because there, I think there are a lot of historians who, who didn't really want that part of the revolution story told. Now they didn't tell it perfectly the first time in the magazine. They 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 1619 project later came out as a book where they got it, in my opinion, exactly right. But but. I am very thankful to the 1619 Project for finally getting this story beyond uh, those of us who, who teach college, basically. But so let me, let's, let's share the story with your viewers, many of whom will, will have heard of it, but as you say, many haven't. So Governor Dunmore was a slaveholder himself, the last royal governor of Virginia, the largest of the British colonies. And so when he issued this Emancipation Proclamation, it wasn't because he cared about that slavery was an evil. It's because he was desperate. In Virginia, unlike some of the other states like South Carolina and New Jersey and uh, Long Island, was all of those were places where there were a lot of loyalists who wanted to stay with, with Britain, but there were very few white loyalists in Virginia. So in November 1775, he issued this Emancipation Proclamation, and it wasn't identical to Lincoln's, but it had a lot in common. It only applied to the slaves owned by rebels. You know, Lincoln's proclamation only applied to slaves in the area that the Union Army hadn't conquered yet. A lot of people say it didn't free a single slave. Well, that's kind of true of Dunmore's proclamation too. You also, you had to be owned by a rebel, somebody like Jefferson or Washington or Patrick Henry, all of whom did lose slaves uh, to the British. And more importantly, you had to get to Dunmore. So the onus was on the enslaved people to reach uh, him. And he said it's the, the line was eight, you have to be able and willing to bear arms, which implies men, although several people, including me, have done the stats. And the majority of the people who joined Governor Dunmore were actually women and kids. You know, men were a plurality, but then women and then kids uh, joined them as well. And here's my point about connecting what African-Americans were doing to the traditional story of the Jeffersons and Washingtons is that. By issuing that Emancipation Proclamation, Dunmore infuriated white uh, Americans because they thought his number one job was to protect them from their slaves. Their slaves were their biggest threat. Again, 40 percent of Virginians are enslaved um, and they want to be free constantly and their owners are terrified uh, of them. And so the, the, the British and represented by Governor Dunmore are supposed to protect them from their slaves. And here they are doing just the, uh, the opposite. As one Virginian put it, um, aiming a dagger at our throats. 
through the hands of our slaves. And actually, I found five other quotes from other colonies where the governor and the Royal Navy ship captains and others were informally cooperating with the British. Uh, four, uh, four or five other quotes using that same phrase. They're, they're inspiring our slaves to slit our throats. And it, I ended up finding uh, more than 76, but I put 76 on Twitter. So if anybody ever wants to go to, uh, uh, I have a bit.ly called Countdown to 1619, uh, where I listed all of these these quotes and, and the documents uh, of just showing how angry the colonists were. And one of the clear statements, you know, uh, Payne said it, Madison, um, uh, Washington, and the, one of the clear statements of anger at the British for forming this alliance with slaves was Thomas Jefferson in his original rough draft of the Declaration of Independence. His longest paragraph, his angriest paragraph, the only paragraph where he accused the British of being bad Christians in all case, in uppercase, was his one denouncing the British. First, he blamed them for forcing people like him to have slaves, which was risible, but then also said, you're now making an alliance with these slaves. And that is a becomes the capstone grievance. You know, they, the expression we still have, save the best for last. That's what a good orator did in those days was would hold back on the on the winning argument. Uh, and then it's the final, you know, when you're making your final summation at the end of the trial, your final thing to nail it into the coffin. In this case, it was his Jefferson's anger uh, at um, the British for this alliance with the slaves. The Continental Congress turned this into a seven word euphemism. He has excited domestic insurrection uh, amongst us uh, so that it's true, the word slave and slavery, neither of those appears in the Declaration of Independence. Well, everyone knew at the time what it meant. But there's just so much evidence that in the South, especially, uh, although there's plenty of these quotes from Abigail Adams in Massachusetts, who was anti-slavery herself, but was even more anti-slave British coalition and and uh, Ben Franklin and others. But But especially in the South, it really was the last straw. And you have people who were loyalist or neutral, and then they went over to the Patriot camp after Dunmore issued his, his Emancipation Proclamation. So there really yeah. was a, a the, the, the African Americans also played a big role. This is an inadvertent role. They weren't trying to get their masters to rebel against the British, but that was the effect of African Americans seeking their own freedom. And it was, it was, it was so interesting to read. I have always thought about the, the fear of a, of a slave revolt as being more associated with the U.S. Civil War and leading up to that. And it was very interesting for me to read about, no, this goes way back before then. So I thought that was fascinating. Lastly here, let's talk a little bit about uh, women uh, before and, and during the, the Revolutionary War. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the role of women? Uh, yes. I've already mentioned these Native women who played such a crucial role, but uh, so did uh, white women and, and African American women. Uh, as I mentioned, the majority of the of, of the African Americans who joined Dunmore, and this was true more broadly across the war, something like ten thousand African Americans went over to the British side, and a majority of them were women and kids. And they weren't just sitting around refugee camps; they were working. Uh, and women, as in all armies, played such a crucial role for the British Army. For instance, I'd like to remind people that laundresses save lives because one of the things they do is boil water and put the soldier's shirts in them to clean that. And they were doing it to make them nice and fresh and clean. But as they did that, they were killing lice. And lice are what convey typhus. And typhus was the number two killer of soldiers on both sides in the army after smallpox. Uh, actually, number one among the British, because a lot of them had had smallpox as kids, and so they were immune to that. And so uh, African American, as well as white women, played really crucial roles uh, fighting on uh, on both sides. A few actually donned men's clothing uh, and fought in the war. And you had some cool stories here in South Carolina of women who uh, acted as Paul Revere's rode ahead of British uh, cavalry units to warn people to warn American militiamen that the British were coming. But at that point, they really were saying the British are coming, the British are coming. So you had women doing those dramatic things, a small number doing those dramatic things, taking over the cannon after their husband died. You've heard the mythical story of Molly Pitcher. Uh, and we don't think it really was a Molly Pitcher, but there were so many other women that she was a composite 
of that's a myth, not because she there was no Molly Pitcher, but because there were so many Molly Pitchers that they sort of folded into one uh, story, mythical figure. So when so women were doing all that dramatic stuff, but they were also doing the sort of day to day, as I said, feeding the uh, soldiers and keeping them. Uh, typhus was really not a big killer of continental soldiers, as it often was, or uh, or on the, much on the British side as well. It was a big killer on the prison ships. You can kind of see why, because there's no women on the prison ships to boil the guys' shirts, and you know the prison guards weren't interested in, in handing fire to their to their prisoners anyway, because that's you know if you let them boil water, they can they can throw it in your face. And so, so I think I think you could say the biggest reason those those prison ships was were such killers was that they were so crowded. But another reason they were so such killers was that there were no women on them to wash those shirts. Yeah, and I think I remember reading in your book that. The, the word, I think it's the word, uh, is it gaunt that comes from, um, uh, Oh, gall, as in gall. Gall, gall, yeah, yeah. yeah. The gall, so American, the, I believe in your book you were talking about American soldiers, uh, yes, who were both out in Lafayette, the field. In 1781, uh, both in, in, at different times in 1781, both Lafayette and Washington marched troops from New York to Virginia, and both of them faced mutinies over tropical disease. Uh, the, the, um, the, the, these soldiers, most of whom were from northern colonies, were terrified. We're going to get to Virginia, we're going to get malaria or yellow fever, and we're going to die. And it was a reasonable worry. The only thing people didn't know is that you could have yellow fever in Pennsylvania. It was a major epidemic there in 1793 and again in 97. But they the, but they were correct that the farther south you go, the more you're getting into tropical diseases. And so that was an issue with the, the soldiers' shirts in addition to that, Lafayette soldiers were worried about getting gall, as he put it, from the soldiers, from their shirts. And so he convinced the women of Baltimore to make new shirts uh, for his soldiers. And he was just copying an idea that a woman in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia had had the year earlier where she got the women of Philadelphia to go out and raise money. She wanted to give cash to the soldiers, but Washington was afraid they'd spend it on beer. So instead, the women used that money to buy cloth and make shirts for the soldiers. So that was yet another way in which women had contributed to the war effort. But it, but I, I couldn't resist mentioning this, this fear that these northern soldiers had of southern disease, because that's the next book I'm working on. This was a very broad general book trying to cover, get everybody into the story. But my next one's on disease and the revolution, because I really got fascinated in how much that affected things. Uh, and so that I'm going to delve deeper into that for the next one. That That is fascinating. And uh, you've definitely got a reader for that. Uh, I recently, you might, you might actually mention this at the beginning of your book, but a few months ago, I also remember hearing this, that when, um, when the colonizers came to the Americas, 90% of the entire population was wiped out by disease. And I mean, just imagine ninety percent of your own town. I mean, that's apocalyptic. It, it really that's... is. Well, and you know, these colonists would move right into these towns that had been abandoned by Indians. They didn't have to build houses. The Indians had left. The house. I mean, they basically left the lights on for them yeah. uh, as they just dropped like uh, flies from those. And it's because they had no, uh, you know, there just there had been no smallpox here before fourteen ninety two. So, as as the demographers put it, they were they were virgin soil. Well, I'll be really interested uh, in your next project. Woody, thank you so much for taking some time to talk to me. I loved your book. This was a terrific interview. Um, uh, I've learned so much. Where can, uh, if folks want to find you, I don't know if you're on social media, but but where I am where can I'm on, Woody, find you? on Twitter, I'm uh, Woody Holton USC. Somebody else had gotten Woody Holton first. So just add USC, which is the name of my university, not the one in California. We call that uh, USC light, but uh, we're at, uh, we're at uh, um, the traditional nice. U USC University of South Carolina. So Woody Holton USC on, on Twitter. And uh, they can also find me on uh, the University of South Carolina History Department's uh, webpage too. Wonderful. This is on there. Okay. Well, uh, again, uh, thank you so much. And well, 12 uh, years you. in the archive, RK, uh, AJ, as you can see, I really enjoy being out of the archive and in talking to you. So thank you. Oh, thank no. You. Uh, well, the joy was all mine. Uh, well, thank you so much.